Okay, so um, welcome everyone to um, today's IMP One World uh, Mathematical Physics Seminar. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce uh, today's speaker, Christian Mais from Leuven. And the title of today's presentation is the Third Law for Non Equilibria. So, Christian, we're very much looking forward for your talk. Thank you, Daniel. And um, I thank the organizers um, not only for inviting me but also for the organization and the initiative that they are keeping up and um, trying to make this one world, maybe sometimes one small world, but at least one world of mathematical physics that's highly appreciated. So I would like to indeed report on um, work that we have been doing with Faze Kodabandelu here in Leuven and with Karl Netocni, who is Academy of Sciences in Prague about a topic which um, may sound a bit un unfamiliar uh, to many of you because it has to do with the third law of thermodynamics, which is not like a very uh, fashionable thing to talk about all the time. But moreover, to put it in the context of non-equilibrium steady state thermodynamics. So um, what I would like to do is to um, go to the central issue, which is if we discuss about the third law, is there also a dynamical meaning we can associate to that? And does that dynamical thing in the end lead to a proof under certain conditions of what we call the Nernst postulate, uh, indeed for certain steady non-equilibria? Maybe you know that in contrast to the first and the second law of thermodynamics, the third law, um, I mean, is not really part of the, is not following directly, say, from the formalism of statistical mechanics. One needs conditions. It's not always valid, of course. And um, if you go to non-equilibrium, which I will explain how you do that, uh, it also needs conditions, of course. And uh, we do not speak then about a general law, one, one would say, but I would prefer to speak perhaps also about an extension of the, of the Nernst postulate. Okay, just to um, put it a bit in context, uh, let me remind you of the fact that we are dealing here with a very old question in a way. It goes back to one of the fundamental issues of uh, classical physics of the 19th century, as Maxwell was um, putting it in a lecture. Uh, it is the problem of specific heats. You know, remember maybe that uh, Maxwell had in 59, in 1859, he wrote a paper about derivation of Boyle's law derivation of diffusion viscosity, but he mentions that he considers the greatest difficulty for this molecular theory, the, the question of specific heats. And he was not alone to do that. They were of course mentioned by many other things. And I want to mention just um, Jeans here, James Jeans, who uh, wrote the dynamical theory of gases. And one way he thought as a possible escape from the problems was to think uh, about the fact that we are just not reached equilibrium, that we have that some degrees of freedom at least do not have statistical equilibrium, and that would then lead to breaking of equipartition and, and so on. Now, um, that is just interesting for the fact that there was a thought about dynamics, but of course that was not the way the question was solved. In fact, the question was put up very much uh, at, uh, at the heart of the of the Solvay conference, the first Solvay conference in 1911, where Einstein spoke exactly about that problem, about the present state of the problem of specific heats. And the main suggestion that Einstein was making also during that conference is to think of the problems together. You know, there were the problems of spectroscopy, which had to do with you know the spectral uh, properties of hydrogen, black body radiation, and what have you to think of them together with the problems of calorimetry. Uh, so spectroscopy and colorimetry perhaps have similar problems can be solved by the similar uh, solutions. And one of the things was is to think of atomic vibrations. Uh, Einstein was thinking about a single frequency and he was trying to understand whether that um, solution or ad hoc solution of Planck could be applied there to understand issues about uh, the problem of the specific heats. On the other side, there was also experimentalists in that conference, people like Nernst indeed, um, who had, together with other people like Lindemann, already done a lot of experiments which were uh, in contrast with the older Dulon um, Petit experiments, reaching very low temperatures and 
somehow he came to the conclusion, and that is some of the basis of the Nevin postulate. He was saying that the change of entropy should uh, vanish when the temperature goes to zero. Uh, that is in a way that the isothermal and the isentropic surfaces should coincide. That's what you can read still today in the textbooks of thermodynamics, that the change of entropy should go to zero. And it immediately implies things about the vanishing of entropy derivatives. For the specific heats, one needs a bit of a much, a little stronger condition because uh, the specific heat is really uh, multiplying with T, but it, it goes in the same sense. So that is in the spirit of, of Clausius, where um, one looks at reversible transformations where the heat divided by the absolute temperature is given by a state function, difference of a state function, which is the entropy. And basically what uh, Nernst is speaking about is that not only the heat released to the reservoir goes to zero, for the temperature going to zero, but also the change in entropy is going to zero. Um, of course, in many cases, we have much stronger uh, information about this in the sense that you can have, when the ground state is well separated from the rest of the energy spectrum, that you could have an exponential asymptotics. But that will be uh, for a little bit later. So just to mention that what we were trying to do, or what we are trying to do, and what on which I want to report today, is to give a possibly far from equilibrium, so a non-perturbative, non-perturbative extension of the Nernst postulate, where there is no entropy, by the way. There is no such and there is no entropy. Still, we want to have an extension of the Nernst postulate for, well, basically the vanishing of the heat and the vanishing of the heat capacities at absolute zero. Now there is another um, spirit that entered the third law, which was not the kind of Nernst closure spirit, but is more like the spirit of Boltzmann. And that was the Planck formulation of the third law in saying that the entropy density for a bulk system goes to zero at absolute zero. And there have been various stages uh, in statistical mechanics to uh, come to terms with that. One important paper was in fact a counterexample by, by Linus Pauling in 1935 about um, ice models, where there was a model which um, well, basically uh, frozen water indeed, water ice, where you have um, uh, a certain model where polling was counting the degeneracy of the ground states and came to the conclusion that there should be a residual entropy. Then this paper was um, somehow connected with more lattice systems, in particular frustrated antiferromagnets, I believe in 1956 by um, Phil Anderson. And then there was um, a, a paper that I believe was in the 70s with Elliot Leap about spin ice, uh, indeed showing the existence of the residual entropy. And there we are speaking about spin ice. So these are models on the lattice. And then still a little bit later, and here is the paper and the reference in JSP 1981. There is a paper by Michael Eisenman and Elliot Leap, which kind of um, somehow gives the general answer, or at least the general formalism, how to deal with the third law for lattice systems, be them classical or quantum, and to discuss the third law indeed in terms of the degeneracy of the ground states. And what the basic uh, insight there is indeed is that um, one, can this, one can understand this entropy density directly from the degeneracy of the ground state, there are some issues like, you know, uh, if you do finite volume, what boundary conditions you have to take. But as they explained so well in this paper, one has to take the boundary conditions with the highest degeneracy. And then in the paper, they give all kinds of examples and classes of models, such as a class of ferromagnetic easing models, for which indeed the third law of thermodynamics is, is verified. But let's not forget that even there, even in equilibrium statistical mechanics, obviously, there are there are counterexamples. Okay, so um, let us now move in the direction of non-equilibrium. And um, what the first thing that we want to do is to set a bit clearer what is the goal, because as I said, there are a, a couple of strange things that is going to happen, because I'm going to speak about the third law without entropy. And as you probably know, temperature is also somewhat a strange thing in, in non-equilibrium. So let, let me spend some time in trying to understand what we mean by that. And um, so the, the first thing that I have to explain a little bit better is what I mean by excess heat. 
And secondly, what I mean by, by heat capacity to come to what is written in blue here, the, the general theorem will be that, okay, to give conditions under which the heat capacity for such non-equilibrium system will tend to zero with temperature uh, under conditions which I, for the moment, describe verbally as well-connected. And um, in fact, this well-connected uh, is something that refers to a graph representation and somewhat interestingly, if one looks, for example, well, here I don't have the reference of Elliot Lee's paper of the 70s about spin ice, but there also was made this connection between uh, the Eulerian tracks, the Eulerian counting, in fact, was a combinatorial problem in terms of Eulerian walks on the lattice and the particular degeneracy of spin ice. So also these graphical representations will continue to play a role in what is going to follow. Okay, so one remark that I want to make, I mean, what do we mean by non-equilibrium? Well, here is just a cartoon of Escher where I um, just put up to tell you that, you know, in, an, in a non-equilibrium world, it's not like the staircases, if they go up or like the water goes up, that it um, kind of, no, you know, you, you cannot have these loops that you would see in this Escher uh, print here. Um, in fact, if you think about equilibrium systems and you look at two conditions with a specific energy, um, no matter what, path you combine these two conditions, it is either endothermic or exothermic. I mean, it's not, I mean, one is always higher than the other because it's just the energy. In non-equilibrium, you, you, the word higher or lower loses its meaning, so to speak, and you come in this kind of strange, more Escheran words where um, the non-equilibria are not just uh, determined by thermodynamic principles or by free energies or energies, but the time symmetric aspects will also play a role, but to this we will, uh, we will go. Okay, so let us um, now come to the first concept that I want to explain, which is this notion of excess heat. I will take a notion of excess heat, there are various notions of excess heat that exist in the world. I call them, in fact, I have, there is a Belgian notion and there is a Japanese notion of excess heat. And we Belgians, we take the Japanese notion of excess heat. I know that some Japanese take the, the Belgian notion, but the, in Belgium, we take the Japanese notion of excess heat. So that's what I want to explain. This is the Japanese notion of excess speed, which we are, which we are taking. Okay, so let us try to make some, um, to boil some water, to make tea maybe. And how you do that? Well, you put some boiler in the, in the battery. I mean, you, you plug it in. So to have the battery to do work, this work is instantaneously in the steady state um, put up into Joule heating and that is spreading hopefully over the entire um, beaker of water to make the water hot. Okay, but now suppose that we are um, keeping this temperature fixed or maybe we do that because it's a very big reservoir. It's really a heat bath. Instead of thinking about your typical water boiler, think about the ocean that very ambitiously you would like to heat with your resistor. Um, of course, then the temperature will basically not change. And um, now you can ask yourself about this power, this Joule power, this Joule heating, which is spreading in this water. And you can ask what will happen actually to that power when we change the temperature of that heat bath, okay? So there is always Joule heating, no matter what temperature you have, but probably it is different depending on what temperature you are. So the cartoon we are getting then is the following here. This is the general idea about this Japanese excess heat, which is you're looking here in the horizontal axis in time and here the vertical axis, I have the dissipated power. Okay, so before time zero, I have some particular power which is dissipated, it's a constant. I have a constant steady state. The notation is P beta. Beta refers to the inverse temperature. Then suppose that at time zero, I make a small change. For example, I make a small change in temperature. So I go to um, infinitesimal d beta that I am changing over this time zero step. Then after long waiting, you probably go into a new steady regime with a certain new power, the power corresponding to a heat bath at inverse temperature beta plus d beta. But there has been a transient and this transient will of course not uh, will exist and it will have extra heat. In fact, what we call excess heat, 
which is this area, which is entirely due to the fact that you connect two non-equilibrium steady states. So just like in the times of closures, where in the thermodynamics of equilibrium, you're connecting equilibrium conditions. Here we are connecting non-equilibrium conditions and the transient to relax to the new non-equilibrium condition, there is an excess heat which is dissipated. And this area here uh, that we see, that is that extra excess, excess heat, which is probably proportional to d beta and the constant of proportionality, that is what we will call the heat capacity. Okay, so the shaded area gives you the idea of this excess heat and in a, in a way also the idea of what we will mean by non-equilibrium heat capacity, but of course this is only a cartoon. Uh, why is this only a cartoon? Well, first of all, we say that we are making here an, an excess heat, which is constant, but of course if you're doing the experiment, you're not starting from the average, you can start from the fluctuations. I mean, depending on what condition you are, it's not this exactly typical point you have. So it may vary over the vertical axis. What is the initial condition you have really when you're doing that? Secondly, when I'm saying that I'm changing the temperature at the time zero, what I really mean is that this is just a little, little step in something which is mathematically to be formulated as a quasi-static transformation. So we are really going to do a quasi-static transformation in a parameter space where we are changing parameters, one of the parameters being temperature. And then this quasi-static transformation will give rise to the uh, definition of excess heat. But the main idea is in the cartoon already. And so experimentally, it is this one. Uh, in the cartoon, it is that one. And now we will move to the more mathematical point. But when I said that I'm doing the, the Japanese excess heat, that is because mostly we are inspired by papers like by Ono and Paniconi about steady state thermodynamics. But this, of course, has been having various versions and various things. I also mentioned the paper by Komatsu, Nakahawa, Sasa, Tazaki about steady state thermodynamics, which kind of started all these, these things also in a kind of more modern perspective. And from there, we have uh, together mostly with Karl Netochny been able or explored definitions of heat capacity. And what I'm talking about now is about properties, low temperature properties of that heat capacity and why and how it goes to zero at vanishing temperature. Okay, now, uh, I mean, once more, if there are questions here, I mean, this is like the introduction. Um, of course, I have to explain many things now, but that's like the introduction. But if there is already a question, of course, be welcome to, to interrupt me at any moment, of course. If not, let me, before I go, in fact, to the to the more mathematical definitions, and though, let me just give you a flavor of the type of models we have in mind, uh, just to, to make it a bit more specific. Um, so there will be non-equilibrium jump processes. There will be Markov jump processes, so-called driven or active. It can be more than one heat bath. So far, I have been speaking like there was one heat bath, but also that is not necessary. But we will consider the dissipation in the stationary distribution. So let me give you some examples of what you can have in mind. So um, here is a, a ring. And on the ring, you see, um, well, kind of artificial atoms or quantum dots, if you wish. But they are just at every dot here, you can have zero or one particle. And they can be loaded. These dots, they can be loaded because they sit themselves in an electronic bath at a certain temperature. and Fermi energy mu. And moreover, they are connected so that there is um, some zeta, which you see here in the middle. The zeta is the work which is done. So in other words, you can have exclusion under exclusion particle hopping between all of these dots. So that's qualitatively the model. So it's really in our situation where we are working under the Fermi golden rule approximation. This is really a driven lattice gas, but a driven lattice gas with birth and deaths at every site. And for the rest, we have just the exclusion principle, which uh, with a bias to move around the circle. Um, let me not say too much more about this model. I hope it is more or less understandable what I'm saying as a model. And so this is, I didn't explain yet how you go, you come to that, but these are things that you can compute. You can compute heat capacities. Um, and so here is the heat capacity of this model as a function of temperature. 
the blue thing that you see, this blue thing corresponds to, um, okay, here's the blue thing, this blue thing here, I believe. Yeah, this is more or less the equilibrium one. And then when you start adding the bias, you see that you get a magnificent increase in low temperature heat capacity. So with a peak, which is a kind of anomaly, the so-called Schottky anomaly that you're getting, but all of them go to zero. You see all the heat capacities go to zero, except that you see maybe the green and the, the red dotted curve. It seems that for certain values of the chemical potential or for the Fermi energy, in fact, you get divergences at low temperature in this model. But um, so, so, so that is, of course, an exactly solvable model. Here is the formula for the specific heat. Um, so that's one of the things you can understand, of course, from the formula. But you would like to have, you know, if you want to speak about the third law, you would like to have a general perspective about what is really going on here, what makes it to go to zero, and what makes it not go to zero. That's what we really are after. But these are the type of phenomenology here for this specific model that you want to understand. Maybe just looking once more at this formula for the specific heat, the first term you will recognize basically as the heat capacity of a two-level system, um, where mu is the chemical potential corresponding to the birth and death process. And then the second part has the non-equilibrium parameter zeta. So this zeta, which is the, the bias basically. And here all the kinetics is. You see, for example, here is a delta, a capital delta, and that refers to the to the kinetic barrier. So in the loading of the of the dot, there is maybe a, a kinetic barrier between the two, which is also has to be activated thermally. And if you have this barrier, um, it, it enters exactly in this non-equilibrium part of the of the heat capacity. So while the heat capacity in equilibrium will pick up basically thermodynamic information, the non-equilibrium heat capacity will in fact also inform you about uh, kinetic parameters. That's something that you will see in general. Okay, so this is just part of a more general class of driven lattice gases, I will not uh, specify. That's another type of system you can wonder about, maybe a bit artificial again, but uh, you basically have a magnetic system. This is this droplet here. Maybe you can think about the Curie-Weiss model if you, if you care. And um, think about it that it is kind of at random times it switches between a reservoir at temperature T1 and a reservoir at temperature T2. So that's how you make it out of equilibrium, right? So it's no, in equilibrium, you would be having the specific temperature fixed. And here you kind of uh, flip it between the temperature T1 and T2, maybe at a certain speed, I mean, at a certain rate. And um, as these spins are in alternating contact with two reservoirs, you still, you can ask, suppose I change slightly temperature T2, what is the, excess heat towards temperature T1 reservoir. These are the type of questions you, you, you would like to ask for such a spatially extended system. Here is an example of what I will call a quantum switch. That's uh, certainly uh, just a two level system, but it's two level switch system where alternatingly the ground and the excited states are switched. So think about like a, a double well potential with a ground state and an excited state. Maybe there is also here a kinetic barrier and at the rate alpha, you're switching between the two potentials. But basically you have two states. You have the zero state and have the one state and it's the heat which is released is only when you're changing states. That's where the heat is. I mean, the heat, if you change the color here, so the color goes from a bit darker blue to a bit gray, that is when the potential is switching, but that's part of the work. So that's not part of the energy change. So the heat is really in these changes and that is what you want to look at if you're looking at the excess heat. So if you now change indeed the temperature again of this environment of this two level system, there will be a, an excess heat and you can again compute it exactly here. Um, it's a four state Markov pro, um, process in fact. So it's a very simple graph, a four state Markov process where you have transitions between a ground state and an excited state except that you can, what becomes, what is excited for one potential is ground for the other potential. So you have also these switches. And um, the specific heat, if you compute it, you find uh, again, something similar with the Schottky peak. Here, the blue peak, is, sorry, the blue curve is the equilibrium. Here you see again, this magnificent increase of heat capacity at low temperature, but it goes to zero, all right? And if you increase the kinetic barrier, something interesting happens, actually, you get negative heat capacity. Again, it goes to zero, all right, at zero temperature, 
but um, you get regimes at low temperature where the heat capacity is zero, uh, sorry, is negative for good reasons that I also will explain, which have nothing to do with stability versus instability, as it would be um, in the canonical ensemble for equilibrium always positive, but here it's very well and very good possible and interesting that it can be negative. It really has to do with population inversion, but um, I will come to that a bit later maybe. Okay, so for less exciting examples, one can go to two temperature, uh, two horizon systems, but maybe that is for another talk. All right, so now let us add a bit of um, notation to all of these models, because all of these models, you know, you, you have to understand in non-equilibrium, it's a bit different from the question equilibrium. Non-equilibrium systems can be small. In fact, in the sense that what is big is the environment. So they are open systems. You know, you can just have a two level system, which is open. And um, the fact that they are open also introduces naturally, at least in this kind of um, Markovian approximation, our formalism, which is just the one of, of Markov jump processes. So, just for the notation, what we have is a general connected and finite graph with some vertices, vertices which will be typically denoted with X and Y and edges. And for example, here we have the edges of the graph and between these edges, whenever there is an edge, there will be a transition rate, which is strictly positive. So to hop from X to Y, there is a rate KXY, to hop from Y to X, there is a rate KYX, okay? So what are these vertices resembling? Well, these are just many body states, right? These vertices resemble or I mean, they can be, of course, simple chemomechanical configurations of a molecule or what have you, but they can also represent a certain configuration of your lattice gas, for example, or spin configuration, etc. We just put them in a general graph and we are studying them. So the states are these possibly energy levels or many body configurations, and the edges are just where the transitions happen. Another piece of notation for this Markov jump process, I will denote by capital L the, the backward generator. So it means that if we look at the master equation for a probability distribution rho t, the L dagger, that would be the forward uh, generator, is just the adjoint uh, of this backward uh, generator in the usual formalism of the simple finite state space um, ergodic, by the way, Markov jump processes, we look at irreducible graphs, finite connected graphs. So there's also a unique, um, a unique stationary distribution. So there is absolutely no problem related to, uh, let's say, the probabilistic aspect of uh, convergence or not. We have a strictly positive stationary distribution, solution of the stationary master equation. And when we put an S on the superscript, we'll refer to stationary expectations. So to just remind you, this backward generator uh, gives rise to the semi group, and the semi group gives rise to the conditional expectations for a function f in general to know what is the state at time t, the expected uh, function at time t. When you're starting at condition small x here, it is just mathematically formulated in terms of the semi group. Okay, so that is summarizing a bit of the standard notation and the standard framework of the simplest possible setup of Markov jump processes. Okay, the next little complication that we are doing is that we are, um, want to understand that there are parameters in our system. And these parameters, they are two types. There is first of all the temperature or the inverse temperature, beta, and then there are other parameters which are denoted by alpha. So we shall now write subscripts to the rates and to the stationary distributions because they may depend on this parameter lambda. So an example is that if we have energy functions around, energy function associated to a vertex X, it may be that, you know, for example, think about a two-level system or a multi-level system, uh, the, the, the energy separation can depend on a parameter, really many parameters, magnetic fields or, or whatever splittings that you have, or just on the volume. So we just summarize all these kind of parameters of external world and parameters in the Hamiltonian, if you wish. We summarize in this alpha and we keep a special place in our heart for the inverse temperature beta, which is thought to be the environment. However, so far, 
this uh, notation and this setup is just pure math. So here comes now the important step. How on earth are you going to introduce temperature? How on earth are you going to introduce heat? So, so now that I have to explain, right? How do you make a connection between this Markov jump process and the kind of fantasies that we have in these driven lattice gases or um, uh, magnetic systems at two temperatures, etc. So how to how to model that? But let me remind you that if you would have an equilibrium dynamics, it satisfies the condition of detailed balance. And one way of writing this is by looking at the forward and the backward rates, take the ratio, and that should be the exponential basically of the energy difference. That's the condition of detailed balance. In other words, no matter what edge in your graph you're taking, there must, ex sorry, there must exist an energy function so that no matter what edge you're taking, you can write this as a difference of that energy. That's, that's the condition of detailed balance. And then we also know that the process is reversible with the reversible distribution, which is given by the usual Boltzmann-Gibbs weight, which is the exponential of minus beta that energy. That's, that's detailed balance. Now, um, I'm not going to teach you about how that arises or where it comes from, but okay, it's um, basically an expression of time reversal invariance. The deep down, if you go to the Hamiltonian picture or the quantum mechanical picture, what is deep down on the more microscopic level is a condition of dynamical reversibility in equilibrium, for example, for the microcanonical ensemble. And what happens if you're taking the coupling limit and you're taking the appropriate approximations in the Markovian approximation, then you get that the open system, which is in contact with the big system, has to satisfy, has to have rates which satisfies this detailed balance condition. Okay, now we are not in equilibrium, but we are in non equilibrium. However, to make still that connection with the, you know, with the usual kind of weak coupling limit that you go build from the, from the reservoirs, you will have to introduce a condition which is called local detail balance. And in fact, for as far as I know, there is a long history of that condition, which at least goes back to papers in the 1950s of Joel Libovitz, where he basically was asking, what is a good model for non-equilibrium? I mean, how do you, you know, how do you set up you have a stochastic model, you have transition rates, or maybe you have a Langevin dynamics. What is a good model? I mean, how, you, how would you organize it? And, and basically the thing is, you have to use local detail balance in the case where this open system, which we call the non-equilibrium system, is in contact with well-separated, you know, under the usual conditions of free coupling, but well-separated equilibrium reservoirs, possibly with different chemical potentials, different pressures, or different temperatures, but if we, for simplicity, consider an environment at a uniform temperature and all the non-equilibrium is because of non-conservative forces or because of um, chemical reservoirs which are different, then we have a local detail balance condition, which is looks like the same thing as in equilibrium, except that now we have a Q alpha XY, which does not need to be a difference of energy. Of course, it is anti-symmetric, under the exchange of X and Y, because the left-hand side is that. But that is now what we will call the heat to the environment during the transition from X to Y. And that is the key connection we are giving between the math and the physical interpretation. So for a recent reference, I'm sorry to, to have here my own reference, but it contains a lot of references to previous works where this condition of local detail balance has been derived or at least ex explained or even used in, in various uh, situations. Okay, so I repeat, um, we extend, we, ex we generalize detail balance to local detail balance to account for um, different possibilities of reservoirs. And so in our framework, we will have that the ratio of these transition rates will be a heat. And you see here, the, the dependence on the parameters gets split. The temperature only depends here and the pre-factor, the Q alpha is just a function of the other parameters. Okay, that is that is what is happening here. Now, of course, we can go back to all our previous models of driven lattice gases and quantum switches and the ones that I have been giving and see if it verifies this thing and whether indeed this Q alpha will be something that we physically recognize as heat. And the answer is yes, because they are good models. Okay. All right. 
So what we were going to do is now to do this non-equilibrium condition, uh, non-equilibrium dynamics with these um, local detail balance. And uh, okay, you can do the simplest things and you can do many more complicated things. Let me skip these things. Let me now go to um, a battery of new definitions which arise from, from that notion. So remember the Q alpha is the heat that you get in a transition from X to Y. Then there is an expected heat flux. So the K you remember is the transition rate. So this is like the, the probability per unit time to make a transition from X to Y and that is the heat flux. So this is together the heat flux. So the heat per unit time when you are in X, the expected heat when you are in the heat, expected heat flux when you are in X. And then there is a stationary heat flux which by convexity is always uh, no negative. In fact, you can characterize the non-equilibrium steady state by saying it's strictly positive. But in general, it's always uh, non-negative, the stationary heat flux. It is the heat, the entropy production power related to that, to the, to the reservoir. Okay, let's take a, a breathing here and let us continue now to introduce the quasi-static process. So we have now, imagine that in this parameter space, I make a smooth time dependent. So I have a curve now you could call it in thermodynamic space, but in fact, these parameters don't need to be all thermodynamic. They can just also be kinetic parameters even. But so, okay, we have some surface or some space of, of parameters in which we have sufficient smoothness to consider a smooth curve. And we have will have um, a time dependence on that curve, which we make very slow. And there is a parameter epsilon, which goes to zero. So that um, on the when the time is one second, really you have moving only one epsilon seconds in the in this in this process. So that's a quasi-static setup that we are taking for the change of the parameters. And then to go to the mathematical definition of excess heat, what you're doing is you're looking at the solution of the time-dependent master equation, where now the generator depends, of course, on time. You're solving for the time dependent probability. And you are looking at the power, the expect, I mean, this is the power at time t. You know, this is the, the instant, this is the probability distribution that you have at time t. It gives the probability of in y. And that is the power, the expected power when you are in y at that parameter value lambda, which is slowly varying. On the other hand, there is also an instantaneous stationary power, which is you do exactly the same thing, but instead of taking the true time dependent probability, you take the probability which corresponds to the stationary probability at that parameter value. Okay, so of course it's also time dependent, but it is the instantaneous stationary power that we are looking here. Okay, so we have two things. We have the, so how as we move in time, and we have the quasi-static change, we have the real solution of the, of the master equation and we get this power. And then we compare it with the instantaneous stationary power. And then we get what we call the, the, the excess heat. So we let it run from a time zero to a time tau epsilon. And that is the kind of mathematical formulation of the cartoon that you have been seeing before. So you're comparing, in other words, these two probabilities. One is the instantaneous stationary one and one or one is the time dependent to look at the power. And if you integrate over time, you get the heat, the excess heat that is. So that's the key quantity to consider. This excess heat, it corresponds again in the cartoon version to that shaded area. Now, here is... Um, Somehow the, the nature of our theorems is the following. It's not quite, it's, I call it a pre-theorem because we don't have everything in space here, but um, we define a quasi-potential and this quasi-potential is at fixed parameter value lambda. You do again an integration over time and again of a difference of powers. So this is the expected power at time T when you start in X minus the stationary power, but all the time at fixed lambda. So I repeat, this quasi-potential is the time integral of a change or a difference in power at the same parameter values, the same temperature. But one is when you keep the initial condition, so it's a transient power and the other is the stationary one. That is converging. Uh, that's exponential. I mean, we have exponent, uniform exponential ergodicity of our Markov jump process. So this integration is absolutely no problem at any fixed beta. And we have that... Um, 
we define this as the quasi potential. So here is the first theorem um, that is that it's not a, it's not the final theorem, but if this quasi potential remains bounded, meaning that you know in the well, just as it says, it remains bounded as the temperature goes to zero, beta going to infinity, then in fact this limit in the quasi-static process of the excess heat goes to zero. So that's the type of third law that we are aiming at, but it's not good enough yet because, of course, this V lambda remains bound. It has to be developed and we have to have conditions for that and all that. But that's, that's what we are going to. So I repeat, the type of third law that we are proving, I mean, this is not yet speaking about specific heat, but about excess heat. So the type of thing that we are saying is that look at this excess heat. So instantaneously looking at the difference in power to the environment, time dependent versus stationary, look at that excess heat, look in the quasi static process, it will be going, it is going to be zero. Uh, in the limit, I mean, this is also in the limit for temperature going to zero. Okay, but we will come to better versions of that. Okay, so here is a first proposition. So uh, here you recall this quasi potential. No, this quasi potential, I repeat, time integral of an excess power. So the first proposition, which is uh, very nice, and it is really something which is saying that this Japanese ex excess heat is, is really the good thing to look at. That is that it's the quasi static limit of this excess heat is geometric meaning it is defined as a curve in just this parameter space. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it does not, I mean, you can reparameterize the curve. It doesn't depend anymore. So to speak on the speed by which you're uh, going through, it just depends on an integration over that curve. And it's an integration over the curve of the integrand being the expected value, the stationary expected value, by the way, there must be an S here, the stationary expected value of nabla of the quasi potential. That's the first proposition. So it's in other words, it gives a geometric representation of the excess heat. If you would have more interesting uh, parameter spaces than the one I am taking here, because that's not the subject of my talk, but you can imagine parameter spaces which have interesting topology, then you can relate this to Berry faces and understand that in terms of curvature of this thermodynamic or kinetic surface, but I'm not doing that. But basically this is an, the usual kind of geometric object that you obtain in a quasi-static process, now here for this, for this excess heat. Okay, now um, in infinitesimal notation, it really means I'm taking somehow the notation of Clausius here. By the way, the letter Q was exactly introduced by Clausius in 1863. Um, so the usual notation is that this excess heat, infinitesimal, it's an excess heat, is uh, given by the stationary nabla of the quasi potential. That is what we have. That's where we are for the moment. Okay. Good. Now, um, this quasi potential is the, in fact, the unique solution of a linear equation. I told you that this quasi potential, you remember, is defined as this integral here, the integral from zero to infinity. But it's it's easy to see, and I have mentioned it even that this is just. Um, given by the semi group acting on the power. So it's ETL on the power. So what you're doing here is really taking a resolvent. So you're really going to a resolvent, which can be written as the, which makes that this quasi potential can in fact be written as the unique solution. It's unique because the average of V is zero in the stationary state. So we are given the P and we have to find the V solution of this set of linear equations. That's basically how we should get the quasi potential, but that's for later. The heat capacity is then, as I said, basically, if you change the temperature, you have to look at this shaded area. And then it turns out that the heat capacity, as you write it as function of the inverse temperature, is up to a beta squared, just the expectation value, the stationary expectation of the quasi potential with respect to beta. Maybe now is a moment also to compare with equilibrium. So if you have detailed balance, then the stationary uh, power is just zero. You don't have entropy production. It's time reversal invariant. You don't have anything. And the, the, the power itself, the, the expected power is in fact the generator acting on the energy because it's the change of energy basically per unit time that you're looking in this power. 
And uh, the quasi-potential, and that's also why we call it a quasi-potential, because it's almost a potential. And, and in fact, in equilibrium, it is just the potential. It is just the energy up to the expected value. So to have that, its expectation is zero. So in equilibrium, this quasi-potential is basically the, okay, the, the energy um, normalized to be having expectation zero. And then uh, you just uh, check from this formula that indeed for fixed volume, for fixed lambda, you get that the heat capacity at temperature is indeed the derivative of the expected energy with respect to temperature. So you just get the textbook formulation of the usual uh, thermodynamics or statistical mechanics of specific heat, um, at least here on the level of taking the derivative of the, of the energy. So in equilibrium, uh, this is the kind of the benchmark where we know the quasi-potential. In fact, you see this quasi-potential only depends on temperature because of its expectation. As such, the, the free the, the dependence on the initial condition is in the energy. Now, you remember also that in uh, one thing in textbook thermodynamics or statistical mechanics is that there is another interpretation of heat capacity for equilibrium, it's not only that it is the derivative of the expected energy, but it's a variance of energy, or proportional to the variance. It's a it's a response, it's a fluctuation response relation that this thermal response, as expressed in the heat capacity, is in fact also the variance of the energy. Well, what it what happens in non-equilibrium? Something very interesting happens, or nice at least, is that you can write this heat capacity as a covariance between the quasi-potential and the beta derivative of the logarithm of the stationary distribution. Again, if you're doing equilibrium, this logarithm is just the, is just the Gibbs factor. So it's exponential of minus beta E. So this gives you immediately the energy. And V is also the energy. So you see how in equilibrium, you just get the covariance in energy. But here you get the, 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 the closures related heat V, and here the Boltzmann related heat. I mean, this is related to the large, the static large deviations. This is related to heat. So in other words, you get a covariance between closures and Boltzmann. And it is exactly that covariance which can be negative. So in other words, if you have population inversion, it can happen that the levels at higher energy need extra energy to decay to lower energy. So instead of releasing energy, they absorb energy to go to a lower energy state. Right? So this is the Escheringen world you have to get used to. But that's exactly what happens if you have an anti-correlation between the closures type of entropy and the Boltzmann type of entropy. In equilibrium, there is only one entropy, which is either related to heat or to fluctuations or to Onsager forces or to fluctuation dissipation relation. It's always the same entropy. But this protein concept of entropy is no longer valid in non-equilibrium. And you see it happen here. Here you get a correlation between a quasi-potential and this kind of um, change in the static large deviations. Okay, but that's again not the subject. Let's go to the thermodynamic uh, features of the third law here. So now the point is that because of this covariance, we can write this excess heat. You can see it here as a as the as the so this is the sum of all the states. By the way, these are all finite sums. No, I'm I'm doing finite systems, um, which is good for non-equilibrium to do finite systems, and it is the product of the quasi-potential and the change of the stationary distribution. So if we want to prove as our main theorem that the heat, the excess heat goes to zero at zero temperature, there are two things we have to do. We just have to prove that this stationary fluctuations go to zero as the temperature goes to zero and the quasi-potential remains bounded. So that's what we need. So the strategy for our proof will be show that the quasi-potential remains bounded uniformly in beta going to infinity. And at the same time, study the low temperature asymptotics of these stationary distributions and see what are the conditions or when does it go uh, in such a way that to exclude the degeneracy that you have sufficient decay so that this is vanishing at zero temperature. Okay, so that is the basic strategy for the proof where the non-trivial part is certainly not for us in the static fluctuations, 
but the non-trivial part is in the quasi-potential to show that it's bounded because you know in non-equilibrium this quasi-potential is not only a quasi-potential but it can be a very non-local thing i mean somehow it's it's really you know in non-equilibrium has very non-local re uh, i mean you know that also the stationary distribution can be very non-local and its fluctuations but somehow at zero temperature you can easily go to non-degeneracy conditions okay so i think i have like uh five minutes or something like that to, to finish this thing, which is not quite what I need, but okay. So I repeat what I said. So the main result will be to give sufficient conditions for the excess heat and for the heat capacity to vanish at absolute zero. And there are static conditions, which is the vanishing of the stationary distribution, so to speak, the non-degeneracy of the stationary distribution. And more, and in addition to what you have in equilibrium, and in equilibrium, there does this dynamic condition plays no role. But in non-equilibrium, there appears a dynamic condition, which is giving you the uniform boundedness of the quasi-potential. So remember when I was giving you the example of the array of quantum dots, there was a divergence of the heat capacity at zero temperature. That was exactly because this dynamic condition will not be satisfied for this range of chemical potentials. Okay. So, so you, you, um, see, you still have 10 minutes, I mean, a bit, so. More than yes, five. But in, in, in Tokyo, it's almost midnight. I also think <laughs> a little bit about how. Yeah, that's time. okay. That's okay <laughs> with me. So, can I ask a question, Christian? Of course. Could you go back to page 40? To page 40. Go back to the. Uh, yeah. So, so you said this vanishing of uh, derivative of rho is something familiar to us from equilibrium, but why did you say this? And, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Good. So, I will explain that. Um, you see, basically, um, well, first of all, Suppose, suppose that this, this stationary distribution just becomes focused on one state, right? So it's a discrete system. So in other words, there cannot be much moving if you're looking around zero temperature, mm -hmm. you, there cannot be much moving if it goes to the focus to be on one state, right? So think about this lambda as the temperature. So you're looking at how the stationary state is changing at very low temperature. So if you're asking that it's getting focused on one state, that then you're finished basically. Yes. The only thing that remains is to give you conditions on mm -hmm. the speed at which it changes. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, but so that's... But that's coming back. That that comes back here. So um so let, let me give you this theorem, which in fact is a theorem by Carl and myself of 2013, um, which describes this Asherian low temperature worlds. So this is a stationary distribution. So here, typically, what, what we prove is that there is, um, there is an exponential. So this is to be understood in the fact that beta goes to infinity. So this is asymptotics as beta goes to infinity. And there is a phi star and a phi that appears here. And this phi star and the phi can be have a graph uh, version in the sense that, um, OK, so there are some definitions. I'm afraid it's a bit difficult to catch all of that just from looking at it. but Basically, the phi, uh, look at the phi here, it is basically related to accessibility. So you're really looking at a certain, you fix a certain vertex Z, and you look how you get by using trees in the graph, you see how it can be reached from various other points in the graph. And the cost that you have to pay is somehow written in this, in this phi function. And there is the best one, which is the most accessible one, which is X star, for which we have the maximum phi star, which we call the dominant state. By the way, this dominant state, it doesn't need to be unique at all, right? Like just anything which is maximizing it is called the dominant state. Now, it turns out that this accessibility, in fact, this phi star and phi, I mean, one would really have to enter more in the feeling the definitions, but it's really a combination of lifetimes and accessibilities. Uh, of course, it reduces to the usual energy things in detail balance, but if you're far from equilibrium, in fact, if you're very far from equilibrium, basically the phi and the phi star refer to the time symmetric aspects of the transition rates much more than to the thermodynamic aspects. So it is, the, it is, exp it is um, in terms of um, lifetimes and escape rates that you can express these phi and these phi stars. But in principle, they are defined as we have here in equation one using um, this idea of spanning trees. In fact, the reason why that is true is rather simple. It comes from the it comes from the Kirchhoff formula, 
you know, usually the Kirchhoff formula, which is a kind of matrix three theorem, is usually very much unuseful because it's too general and it doesn't say anything. But for asymptotic regimes, for this kind of friedland wenzel regime in which we are interested, in fact, it is useful. In fact, because there are many things that just disappear. So, so this representation with Kirchhoff for the large deviation theory of these Markov jump processes is in fact very useful. And you can then from this Kirchhoff formula, I'm not going to explain even the notation, but it's basically an expression of the stationary distribution in terms of trees and accessibility of the state. You can use it to get the right conditions. Uh, I'm not going to explain that you can get these uh, expressions of the low temperature asymptotics and you get the good static conditions for both vanishing of heat capacity and vanishing of excess heat in, um, in, in terms of, um, well, in fact, you, you don't need the things as strong as they are, but um, these are certainly sufficient for our theorem to be, to be valid. So basically we are asking for vanishing of heat capacity that you get a strict non-degeneracy. So you just go to one state. So there's nothing here, I repeat, there is nothing here about changing the volume and looking at the asymptotic way the volume scales and the entropy scales. No, we are fixing a scale of the volume and we have a large open system, we have an open reservoir. Okay, so these are related to conditions for the static fluctuations. As I said, much more non-trivial in our life has been the boundedness of the quasi-potential. So it took another, whatever, 10 years before we understood, thanks also to um, Faze, uh, how to do this low temperature asymptotics of the quasi-potential. Because as I said, this is no longer simply an energy. It's something which is globally defined and is somewhat difficult. And there are like basically two techniques. One is to not use the matrix three theorem, but to use the matrix forest theorem. In fact, to solve these nonlinear equations for the quasi potential. But I, let me start by a soft argument, which already tells you what is the physics, which is uh, the intuition, which is going to play. Okay, so let me start with, uh, instead of the, like the heavy machinery of the matrix forest theorem, let me start with the proof via coupling, which is sufficiently simple in one slide but it's not optimal, but at least it gives you the right intuition. So first of all, there is a lemma, which I have not mentioned, but it suffices for the boundedness of the quasi potential, which is the integral of the excess power. It suffices, in fact, to look at differences of uh, between edges. So you just take two neighbors, X and Y, and if they are bounded, then you're done. So that gives you an integration less somehow. So, so in other words, if you have that the differences are bounded, then also the quasi potential is bounded. But now if you look at this thing, what happens here is that you basically have two random walks. One is starting from X and another is starting from Y. So if you see a difference of a function at time T, what you do is you couple them, of course. So you take a random walker or you take it on the double graph, you take now a random walker, um, and you optimally couple them, one starting from X and one starting from Y, and obviously there will be a first meeting time. Meeting time between X and Y, a random meeting time when they enter the first vertex. And since we have an optimal coupling from them, they are just equal. Okay, so now, of course, if you take the difference of any function of these two random walks, if the, if the time is before the, if, the if, if you're after the meeting time, this is just zero. Before the meeting time, well, you can estimate it with some, some, some uh, variation norm. You can look at how, how you can estimate such a difference. But the basic thing is that you have something of a measure of the, say, the diameter of the graph, the variation of the function, and then you basically have to be before the meeting time. So this means that this change of this, uh, this, this difference in quasi potentials can be estimated by the variation in the power times the meeting times, but we have a meeting time, which is just between two nearest neighbors. So we have two nearest neighbors and we ask what is the first meeting time? Okay, so this we can further develop, which I'm not doing here, but you see the intuition is the following. You have two things to care about. You have on the one hand, a time, which is related to relaxation time, basically, meeting times or relaxation times. And on the other hand, you have dissipation. So there is a dissipation time and there is a relaxation time. 
And so what enters physically as a heuristics for the third law is that the relaxation times have to be smaller than the dissipation times. You see, this power is related to the dissipation you have in the loops of your graph. So there is a certain power and the time that it takes to turn around, that's like the dissipation time. So it's like the inverse of the power. And since this has to be bounded, it says that the, I'm, I'm using the words relaxation times now, have to be smaller than the dissipation times. Or, well, you can make more precise statements, but that is the physics heuristics that you are lead, led to, namely that you have to compare in what sense can there be localization of the, of the energy in your graph compared to what are the typical dissipative loops that you have in your graph. In equilibrium, the dissipation time is infinite, so it's always satisfied. But in non-equilibrium, there's a finite dissipation time because we have dissipation. So the rate of dissipation is finite. And in other words, you will have that there is a non-trivial condition that arises, namely you have to no delay, no delay in relaxation compared to the, um, to the, to the dissipation times. In other words, the violation of the third law at zero temperature will be a dynamical phase transition of localization. So that what we had in this, in this array of um, this driven lattice gas is exactly a sharp transition where you're moving between a, a kind of keeping the energy localized towards having it spread over the graph compared to the relaxation times uh, uh, for temperature going to zero. Do, do, you have a, do you have a sharp phase transition even in finite systems, small systems? That's zero temperature, right? Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So of course, uh, that's, that's just the reason why, of course, you, I mean, what, what, so I'm talking about zero temperature. You can of course also ask, but that's another talk, whether in the heat capacity at finite temperature for non-equilibrium systems diverges at critical points. That's another question. That's for the next time. But here I'm just talking about finite systems. Indeed, I am stressed that I'm talking about finite systems, but nevertheless, you have these dynamical localized phase transitions at zero temperature, which is possible. Okay, so that intuition is a bit, uh, okay, here is a counterexample, which perhaps I don't want you to bother with, but there can be very easy counterexamples. I mentioned this counterexample also, but let me not, uh, okay, the, the slides are there. I mean, if people read the slides and have questions, they can always contact me to zoom in on a particular slide to better understand the counterexample, but I think it's sufficiently late not to speak about the details of these counterexamples. Um, let me just mention to, to close the, the application of the matrix Horace theorem. So because this is a little bit less known than the matrix three theorem. So the matrix Forest theorem gives you um, a graphical expression in terms of forests simply instead of terms of trees. So a forest is basically a collection of trees. Um, gives you a matrix forest or a graphical expression for the quasi potential which solves these linear equations. So everything is known here. The K is known, the Q is known, the P is supposedly known. This is the, the stationary dissipation. And um, then we can start to see and apply the matrix forest theorem for that. And one of the things that are almost immediately is that, okay, so, okay, I'm not, I'm, so I have to be careful not to move too fast here, but on the other hand, time is running. So, so one of the things that are quite easy to check is that the third law, will always hold on the complete graph. I mean, this is just something which is easy to see from the, from the matrix uh, forest theorem. And that somehow tells you that the more connections you have in your graph, the more accessible or the, how many transitions you are, the more dynamical accessibility you have, the more chance you have, in fact, to have the, viol to have the verification of this, of this third law. More generally, there appears a condition, which is a graphical condition, which has to do with understanding the boundedness of this quasi potential as it appears from the matrix forest theorem. Um, but maybe I think it is enough uh, like that. And let me not, um, okay. So you still see a formula here about the, mat the graphical representation of this quasi potential, but basically then it amounts to an analysis of uh, these weights, which is weights of trees, which appear in the forest because all the other things are basically under control. So you basically have to control these weights to understand the boundedness of the quasi potential. Okay, I think I would like to stop here. And uh, of course, very happy to 
to get some extra questions, but um, I'm sorry that I took so much of your time already. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. That was a really very interesting and beautiful talk. Thank you. So I now leave the floor to the audience for comments or questions. Please. So maybe actually I have one. So you mentioned your results is for finite systems, right? I mean, uh, and isn't it, I mean, do you think somehow the extension to the infinite volume is, is somehow it's a hard okay. technical okay. problem or would you like to do it as a fundamental okay. problem? You see, you see, you have to understand something. Suppose I have one of the main questions in non-equilibrium is to understand boundary driven systems. Now a boundary driven system, if you take a thermodynamic limit, <laughs> it becomes equilibrium basically. Mm -hmm. So you're really interested in finite systems. Mm -hmm. So you see, if you have, you're driving a system most of the time in non-equilibrium, you're having a reservoir to make heat conduction, to make particle conduction. You're frustrating your system at the boundary. So what is big is already outside of your system. And I'm really interested in the thermal properties related to my small system. Okay, so in that way, I evade your question, but let me not com be completely dishonest. <laughs> I mean, I'm not dishonest really, but let me let me still go in your direction because we also have non-equilibrium systems which are bulk driven, okay? And bulk driven is, for example, when you have, um, well, he, uh, well, that is for, and the one that you see on the slide, that's, that could be a bulk driven system, but uh, actually not quite, but okay. But I mentioned also these kind of uh, asymmetric exclusion processes with speed change. Mm -hmm. These are bulk driven systems. Mm -hmm. And there indeed, you can start to wonder about um, the asymptotic limit, the thermodynamic limit and look at you know, specific heats. So we have exactly solved the modes of specific heat where we see exactly the same happening as uh, we're doing in the, in the finite systems. But we do not have at this moment uh, a kind of good way of understanding uh, these thermodynamic limits. In fact, you see, you have to well be aware that the non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, <laughs> there is no such theory as the Gibbs formalism of non-equilibrium systems. No, sure, I mean, sure. mm -hmm. thermodynamic limit is not something which is well developed. Even sure. an idea like what you mean by non-equilibrium mean field system is already problematic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, but so in the infinite volume limit, your condition on the on the on the quasi potential would become a um, so so that's an uh, so, specific, a specific okay. density, no? it all right, a quasi density or something. But mm -hmm. I I kind of you know I usually would like to start from good models and motivations. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's true that at first sight, coming from equilibrium statistical mechanics, you're saying, but what is this? I mean, you have like a graph with a finite number of states. Well, okay, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And that and covers that covers a lot of examples which are interesting. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's clear. Yeah. Uh, other questions or comments? Well, I I have infinitely many questions. <laughs> Go ahead. Can, yeah, can I ask, yeah, can I ask one nasty question? So, sure. uh, so I noticed that many of your conditions are written in terms of graph theoretic language, and that's beautiful. But, but that is because that works because you are working on this discrete system Markov jump process. So, but you know, uh, what what do you think about? treating continuous systems like system. Well, you see, you see that, thank you for that question. And it's yeah. given me also an opportunity to, to say that the same thing is not true, does mm -hmm. not hold. There is no third law for the fusion processes. Okay. So you could do, you could do the same yeah. thing speaking about, um, yeah. I don't know, non-equilibrium diffusion processes modeled in the sense of Newton's equations plus noise. Hmm. There is no third law. They are okay. too classical, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there you, you enter in the usual kind of mm -hmm. problem that mm -hmm. Maxwell had in 1860. Okay, yes. yes. No, there is no third law. Mm -hmm. Low temperature physics is just wrong for these mm -hmm. classical diffusion processes. Yeah, you have to go to that's quantum. Why, that's why mm -hmm. we go to Markov jump processes. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. even there, even there, some of the problems we are having Mm -hmm. have to do with the incoherence of the transitions, even mm -hmm. there, because we have to add somehow the tunneling by hand. You know, the fact that we have these kinetic barriers and that we take them serious is because we are thinking in the classical way. 
but if you have bodies and quantum processes, you can also, there are other ways to circumvent them. So mm -hmm. in fact, we are doing here what is called, well, I don't know how to call it, but it's classical, but it's quantum. It's like you go to the discrete case, you go to Markov jump process, somehow simulating a Dirac Fermi golden rule process. But on the other hand, you're still keeping with the Arrhenius type of laws for thermally activated process and all that. And that in fact, can give you trouble because that makes these kinetic bodies makes that you become less um, connected. Mm -hmm. Was that your question, Hal? Because yeah, I yeah, yeah. myself mm -hmm. in another direction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. And oh, yeah, I, I have one related question is that this quasi potential V plays very, very essential role in your theory. So does it extend to other classes like, like continuous systems or? Oh yeah, so of course. Oh, okay. I mean, if you, of course, this, okay. this formalism of mm. excess heat and the quasi potential mm. as such, okay. that extends to um, mm -hmm. okay to classical continuum systems mm -hmm. and all that. That's not a problem. Okay, when so I that's a mention. universal part. Okay. Yeah, that's a universal part. Mm. Mm -hmm. And you, you at one place you you identify this V with Clausius entropy. Yeah, because you see, uh, mm. yeah. So, I mean, of course, there is some part, there is some rhetoric in uh, this sentence uh, just because I like it, mm -hmm. but there is, but there is something true in it. You know, think about the origin of entropy is of course mm -hmm. closures, which is related yeah. to heat. So yes. here we are talking mm -hmm. about excess heat. Mm -hmm. So this V is directly related to excess heat as we have seen, mm -hmm. but in, it's like the thermodynamic version of the excess heat yes. where you're moving slowly mm -hmm. in parameter mm -hmm. space. So. Mm -hmm. You know, there are also these beta squared in front and take one beta and put it with V lambda. This is like entropy, right? So this right. is like a closest entropy. Okay, yeah. And then this guy, mm -hmm. uh, okay, this is like cone. This is like the logarithm. This, this, is the, this is the functional corresponding to the static fluctuations. Right. And take yeah. another temperature and you mm -hmm. get the Boltzmann entropy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, this is nice. I like it too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, other questions? So it does not seem to be the case. So uh, let's thank again, Christian, for the very nice talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.